the, uh, the Wi-Fi is being unreliable with me today. So I have, I have it on, on video, and then I can always throw it on the computer later on. So, all right, well, Arnith, Arnis, Arnis Hunter. Hunter. Let's pray for her right now. All right. So, oh, okay. So, Father, uh, we just bring up Arnis to you. Uh, in Jesus' name, we pray the healing that you purchase on Calvary's Hill into her life. We also uh, come against every spirit of cancer and death uh, that would uh, afflict her. We declare by the cross of Christ that every demonic power is canceled, bound, muzzled, and rendered judged and defeated. And so we pray victory into her in Jesus' name, released to the captive. And we thank you, Lord, that whom the Son sets free is free indeed. So we call her free in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Um, Speak up. I forgot this. Oh, oh. all right. <laughs> okay. We're, we're going to be in uh, 2 Corinthians 13. And we'll um, we'll go through that. It's not very long, but there's some in, important points here that we don't want to miss. And then uh, I think any suggestions that you have for um, the next book we want to look at, okay? The what? The next book oh. that we might want to look at. All right. So. Oh, she's got it. All right, there we go. Okay. Are we all there? All right. Um, well, I tell you what. Why don't we? Um, why don't we start with with Jack Nightlinger over there? Uh, if you will read chapter 13, verses uh, oh, 1 through 4. And then, Judy, if you'll read uh, 5 through 10. And it, Myrtle, are you up to reading today? No? Okay. Then, um, Vicki, if you'll read 11 to the end of the chapter. Okay? So we're in 2 Corinthians 13. Starting with verse 1. And um, this will be my third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I already gave you a warning when I was with you on the second time. I now repeat it while absent. On my return, I will not spare those who sinned earlier or any of the others. Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me, he is not weak in dealing with you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power we will live with him to serve you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test, and I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not that people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is for your perfection. And this is why I write these things when I am absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. Finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection, listen to my appeal, be, the one, be of one mind, live in peace. And the 
God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Okay, thank you, thank you. All right, well, let's, there, there are some points there I think that, that we would do well to look at as we, um, well, as we consider our own lives and as we consider our lives as the body of Christ, you know, in our communities and, and the body of Christ throughout, throughout the world and the country. Uh, first of all, Paul says in verse 1, this is the third time I'm coming to you. Every charge must be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. And what, what he's really saying there is that I've been there twice, and those people who are insisting on sinning have not repented. So when I get there a third time, then this will bear witness to me about whether or not you're really sincere in following the gospel, all right? And I want you to notice that he says this, I warn those who sinned before and all the others. Now, I want you to notice that. Like, I warn those who sinned before and all the others, all right? So we get it when you warn someone who's in active sin. I mean, I would get that, all right? But what do you think all the others means? Why would he warn all the others? All right, but he's already warned people that sin. So why, why all the others? Well, maybe. Um, what else? Second chance. All right, second chance. But now again, what I'm trying to what I'm trying to focus on is that okay, so he warned the people that sinned. All right, he's warned them again, coming a third time. Okay, but there are these others he's talking about too. They're not, they're not those that are actively engaged in sexual immorality or things like that, but he's warning them too. So what would that be about? Tolerance? No. No. All right. well, let me suggest two things. All right. And for that, I want us first to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Okay? All right. Now, I'll start at verse 1. Okay? It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit. And as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Now, this is what our Lord would call excommunication, or being removed from the community. But now, I want you to look at this. In verse 6, your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? 
cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. So what the, the first thing he's saying when he's warning the others is he's warning the whole body that, that when you turn a blind eye to sin, really any sin, but in this case, sexual immorality, when you turn a blind eye to this, then what you're doing is you're opening the door for that leaven to grow and affect the whole body. So it's no longer a holy Christian church. It's an unholy Christian church. It looks like the world. It doesn't look like the people who are separated from God, or for God, I'm sorry, but from the world. So he's warning the whole body that you don't tolerate sin. There's a procedure to go through. But in the end, if they would be unrepentant, you don't tolerate it. You remove them. They need to know that this is not something that as the body we can accept because it affects our witness. All right, it affects our witness with regards to the holiness of God and the purity of his kingdom. It, 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 it affects that. The other thing that he's doing, though, if you want to turn to Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, verse 32. Okay. Verse 32. Okay. Now Paul has just talked about all the sins in the calendar essentially that drive us away from God and bring his wrath upon the world, okay? But then he says this, though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. All right? So the other side of this is, and we saw that in, 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 that, in that 1 Corinthians 5 passage, even those who weren't doing the things that this man was doing or maybe they weren't getting drunk or maybe they weren't uh, working with prostitutes or maybe they weren't even in lawsuits, but they were approving of the behavior. And their theological basis for approving of the behavior was one that unfortunately is found throughout the church today. It, it's a misuse of grace. The idea that God's grace means that now you can just have a free-for-all with your life. It doesn't matter what you do. God doesn't judge anyone. Just have a good time. All right? So this is what's going on. And, 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 and Paul is saying, so those two things, if you go back to 2 Corinthians 13, to the others, he's warning them, one, don't, don't turn a blind eye to it because it will affect your witness. And then two, don't approve of it because you're leading someone to hell. And that someone, by the way, might be you if you're approving that. It's uh, this day and age Sex out of marriage shack up. Uh, they want to. They condone it. Oh, that's okay. That's okay. But in God's eyes, it isn't okay. Well, it's not okay. But they, everybody. Well, you're judging me. You're you hypocrite. You're not supposed to be telling me what I can do and what I can't do. Right. Right. And I've seen this. Right, and I want, let's deal with that because it's, it's, it's an important thing to deal with. Matthew 7. 
You want some help with that? I oh, I'll. All right. Ma Matthew chapter 7. All right. We're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. Okay? Because you, you bring up an excellent point. By the way, this is the one piece of scripture that even unbelievers know. They keep this in their back pocket. All right? Just part of it. Not all of it. Just the part that they need. All right? Matthew chapter 7. Well, God's involved in it for sure. <laughs> Matthew chapter 7. All right? Now, I'll go ahead and read these verses. These are the verses that, that, that the devil loves that people know them so that he can twist them. Okay? I don't even need to look at the verse. I'll tell you what it says. Judge not, lest you be judged. And immediately what they do is they go, well, see, you can't judge me. Who are you to say I'm wrong? The one I really love is only God can judge me. I saw, actually, I saw a, a picture where the guy, uh, the, the one person says only God can judge me. And the next picture has this guy looking like this going, yeah, that should scare you. That should concern you. All right. The, the, but what, what they don't do what, after they show that is they don't go through the rest, of the, the rest of the verses. Because it says here, okay, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So what, he, what, what he's saying here is that the problem with judging, and now he's, he's talking to at this point, he's actually talking to very religious people, okay? Is that the problem with the judgments that are going on, and this was especially true for the Pharisees, but it was also true for others, is that when we're judging, we tend not to care about the reconciliation of that person. We tend to just be angry and point our finger. The second thing that we tend to do is we tend to get angry about minor things rather than be concerned about major things. All right? Like, I'm going to judge you based on, well, let's just do something based on the clothing you wear. Without a thought of the sexual immorality going on in my own life. Okay? We're majoring in minors, not in majors. Okay. That's why Jesus says, look, before you go and take the speck out of your brother's eye, examine yourself and take the log out of your own. And then you'll see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. By the way, doesn't mean don't take the speck out. But before you do that, make sure you've taken care of your own stuff so that you can see clearly with compassion to help that person. All right? See, it's one thing to talk to somebody about pure life. And there's one thing to talk to a homosexual, for example, and say, look, I've been where you're at. I know the disappointments. I know the pain. You do not have to live like that because I know the one who can save you. And to help them move out of that lifestyle is another thing to tell them that they're unredeemable and they need to just get out of here. And in the meantime, you're forgetting all, all the sins that, in your own life that are also unredeemable, but for the blood of Jesus. Okay? So, Jesus is not saying don't judge between right and wrong. But when you judge, make sure you're judging rightly. And by the way, he makes this point right here. Verse 6. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before swine. Now, what he's saying there to the people of God is you do need to care about what's holy and unholy. Dogs and pigs are what? Unholy, unclean. You do have to care about what's holy or unholy. Now, by the way, with, the one, with regards to dogs, 
he is actually making a statement about sexual immorality too. Because the word dog there doesn't always mean an animal. It can mean uh, a man who's giving his services to other men as a as a homosexual uh, uh, for homosexual sex. And it's like, mm -mm, no, you don't give to them what's holy. So he's he's definitely saying here that you need to make a distinction between what's of God and what's not of God. But we always have to have an eye towards redemption. We're not just trying to poke our neighbor in the eye. <laughs> Can I bring up something? Sure, go ahead. Um, I've seen it where men and women have taken and not married and they've shacked up and there's no responsibility on either partner. And when they do, decided to get married, there was nothing but chaos. And they got divorced less than a year after they got married. So it shows you, uh, unless you're hooked together as one, you ain't gonna function. Yeah, and you know that it, the one thing that you're, you're you're talking about there, which has actually been been proven uh, statistically, is that see the the thing that people are saying nowadays is well, oddly enough, my daughter is taking a sociology course, has to take one to get through her degree, and um, it. it what she's learning in sociology and what I learned in sociology are two entirely different universes. Way different. Because the fact of the matter is what she's learning in sociology right now is nothing more or less than pornography. That's what she's learning. She's learning about orgasms. She's learning about uh, any number of ways that people can get together sexually and how wonderful it is. And, and that kind of thing. They haven't, they haven't really talked about anything in that sociology class, we're almost done with the class, except pushing the sexual agenda of, of the perverse in our nation, right? That's why I told her when, 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 when you get out of this course and you're allowed to write an evaluation, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and they don't know who you are until the grade is already put in the book. I said, I would write, honestly, your evaluation that they should change the name of this course to Introduction to Pornography. Because that's what it is. But the one thing they ignore in all of this are the actual studies done not by Christians, but by government agencies that show that, and by universities, which are, 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 are not sympathetic to the Bible, and they're not sympathetic to what God has to say. But nevertheless, their own studies indicate that even though nowadays you have a, a hookup culture, is what they call it, all right, where it's not even living together anymore. It's like I'll go with like for the night. And now they have these things called thruples. Three guys and a woman and you know and some children or what have you. It's, it's really perverse out there. But anyway, the thing is, even in their own statistics, they show that when people decide to live together before they're married, the divorce rate it's like 75% once they get married. It just, it just, it doesn't help them uh, in their marriage. Primarily because in the end, who's the, who's the foundation of the center of marriage? Who? God. If God ain't in it, it ain't gonna work. And if you're not gonna do it his way, it ain't gonna work. Not. Uh, another thing I, I've noticed uh, a lot of the 
I, I see where a lot of people do shack up without getting married. The reason why they don't want to, because the lawyers have just absolutely, uh, I don't know how to say this, to Paul, like a woman, uh, usually you split half and half when you get divorced. And I've seen that, which <laughs> is crazy what I'm gonna say. But uh, they get half, and then they get half of the man's stuff too. You mean they get, they get more later on? Well, they, yeah. they, they're just playing, and that's why a lot of them don't get married. Well, and that's the thing, again, if you're gonna get married, but you're worried about divorce, don't get married. That's just the way it is. And don't be together. Don't. Because if, if, if anyone goes into a marriage thinking, well, I'll try this out, and then if I get a divorce, then I have a prenup, so that <laughs> I can hold on to what I can. You know what? You should not be married. Shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. But I want to say this, too. It's not just about that. Because look here. That, go back to Second Corinthians. All right. That's the one we often talk about because that's the one that's getting, you know, the most play as far as undermining the morality of our, of our kids. But there's more that goes along with that. If you look at 2 Corinthians 12, okay? Verse 20, Okay? And the last part of verse 20, I'll, 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 uh, I'll just read the whole thing, okay? For I fear that perhaps when I come, I may find you not as I wish, and that you may find me not as you wish. And perhaps, you now watch this, there may be quarreling, jealousy, anger, hostility, slander, Gossip, conceit, disorder. Now, none of that has to do with sexual immorality, per se. But those are other things that you clearly find in the world. They do not have a place in the body of Christ. They don't. You know, and, and by the way, just a jealousy, okay, I want to deal with that just for a moment because I mentioned this at the other Bible study. But, you know, we need to understand that, that, that jealousy is a real emotion. And we really need to be careful about that. You know, we can actually make excuses that sound nice, but they're, they're wrong. Uh, you, know, you know what we might call jealousy? So that we can get away with it, we'll call it righteous indignation. See, whenever you want vengeance, you're in sin. You can call it righteous indignation all you want, but you're in sin. And what? And when I was when I was um, in confirmation, there was a kid there. He was a a boy. I think, he was, I think he was adopted, all right. And the older couple had him, and they were, they, 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 they spoiled him. He would come to the confirmation camp class before the teacher would come in and take out his wad of money and show us just how much he had, yeah, a lot. I mean, for, for anyone, but you know, it was like, and then you know, he'd throw it under our nose to show us that we were nothing, right? And so I go back to my house, my apartment, where we're using cardboard boxes for furniture, right? And, you know, I'd read the Bible, and I really enjoyed the fact that the rich were really going to get theirs. Yes. <laughs> right? And then as I got older, the Lord dealt with me on that. said, so, uh-huh. So, you're upset with him because he's rich or because he annoyed you? 
and made you feel small. I was like, oh, I didn't like me. It made me feel small. He said, well, he might be greedy, but you're jealous. And if you don't deal with it, you're just as guilty as he is. They were not allowed to be jealous. No matter what, the guy can have a million bucks. God bless him. If he's using it right, praise the Lord. I got no business being jealous of that. But I can always justify my, my anger and my jealousy. I said, well, I was righteously, righteously indignant. There's the word again. Yeah. But. Yeah. But. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I like that. See, we can't do that. No, I know, but if yeah. you listen to somebody, at least you pick up on it. Yeah, yeah. See, as soon as you say but, yeah. you've erased everything else. Yeah. All right. But is a big eraser. <laughs> I believe, but. You know what I've had to learn to do in my life? Not use the word but unless I actually mean it as a conjunction. All right. When it comes to God, I don't use the word but. Amen. All right, amen. <laughs> so when you see here, what he's saying then is when he's coming, there are all kinds of things going on in their lives that are not good for the body of Christ, and it needs to stop. And he's warned not only those who are actually doing it, but those who are actually supporting it because somehow they think God's grace uh, empowers that and those that wink at it. You know, the, the, the ones that wink at it are like this. All right? We can do this for everything. And we can do it in politics and we can do it wherever. All right? Well, I personally don't believe in it, but. Oh. It's in the butt. But it's not my affair. Or I'm not responsible for them. You know, God said to Cain, where's your brother? Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? Well, you're actually supposed to care about your brother's welfare. Yeah, where is he? Oh, wait, his blood is crying out of the ground for vengeance. That doesn't mean we can't in our, 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 our neighbor's business. There are some things we, we, we need to leave well enough alone, but we see our, our neighbors in sin. And we don't, at the very least, speak to them about what's going on or pray for them. We're in real trouble. Okay? We're, 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 we're not helping the situation by turning a blind eye to it. And say, well, that's that's their concern. It doesn't concern us. Yeah, it does concern you. Because, see, one of the problems, too, as Christians, is that very often we, we become too individualistic and we don't realize that, that we're part of a larger body. And if we turn away and don't deal with that sin or don't, I'm talking about biblically now. I don't mean going off half cut. I mean biblically deal with this thing. Then we're affecting other people by being silent. If you don't do it in love, you're not going to get any results at all. Yep. And you may not get any results even if you do it in love. I know. But, the, the, but you're right. I mean, we're called doing love. But the other side of that, brother, is a lot of people say, well, then let's not do it. Well, and that, that, that's, where, that's where somebody has to step up, which is what Paul was doing, and saying, you know, this, this needs to happen. You need your leadership. Now, I want to tell you where the love is in this, okay, because it's, Paul can sound very harsh here, but he's not. This is, how many visits is this to them? This is number three. He's written to them a number of times about this. He's shown up two times prior 
He's coming on the number three time. At this point, he's done everything he can lovingly, patiently. Say, this is where you need to change. But sometimes love also means finally saying, you know what? Patience is over. It's done. And we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna discipline. Because that's what he says here. So maybe let's look at that. Okay? There's something that I'm sitting here really thinking about. And actually it's your daughter. Mm -hmm. I, I guess for every one of us here, I think we should be in prayer for her and anybody else that's taking that class. Mm -hmm. Because I'm sorry, if they're making you read that stuff, it goes into you. Mm -hmm. And it's not good. No, it's not. And the other thing is, this whole thing about taking a stand for what's right. I mean, we're seeing in this nation, nobody is taking a stand for what's right. Mm -hmm. For very few people. Yep. We're seeing it in our government. We're seeing it right here in our state. And anybody that takes a stand. Yeah. Well, yep. the only thing I see, basically what I see happening, anything wrong is considered right, and anything right is considered wrong. That's what I'm seeing. Well, and, and we are in that period. You know, Isaiah, the Holy Spirit warned through Isaiah, uh, woe to you who call evil good and good evil. And and we're finding that. I actually, um, I, I mentioned this earlier uh, on Facebook, and I mentioned it during a sermon, but in California now, they're going to they're, 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 they're moving to have elementary kids, and I forget what part of California this is, but uh, in the school system, when they're going to invite them to chant, pray to, invite into their spirits, the Aztec gods, and to renounce while they're doing that, the Christian God. Because the Christian God, according to their school board and those that are pushing it, is the one who caused all the problems to begin with. But what this requires them to do is to ignore the facts of, of history. Do you realize what the Aztec gods were? When you go into the Old Testament and you read about Baal, all right, Baal and Asherah, yeah. they did human sacrifice with Baal and Asherah, children. They performed all kinds of evil. And this particular, quote, God and goddess uh, made a point of making war against the God of Israel. Well, who do you think that is? Satan. Well, the Aztecs, their, their gods demanded human sacrifice. And I mean, to the point where, where, where the priests, they, they had these pyramids, okay? And you go up there, and the, 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 the person was still alive. And they would lay them out, rip them open, take out the heart, and eat it in front of people. And the heart was still beating. Right. And, and, and they would, at one point, they, they did this uh, in, 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 in one, where they have the actual documents from the Aztecs. They did that to 80,000 people in one day. The gods of the Aztecs are like Baal. They're, they're demon gods. So that when, when Cortez came in, okay, the reason... There are two reasons why Cortez beat the Aztecs. Number one, I'm going from the lesser reason to the greater reason. Lesser reason, and that's number one, is that when he landed on the beaches and the other Indian tribes found out that he wanted to defeat the Aztecs, all of a sudden his numbers went from 120 to several thousand. 
because they all wanted to stop those sacrifices. All right? Because they were, the Aztecs would go out and basically collect a crop from these people, the people, human beings, and slaughter them to these false gods. Now, the second reason why Cortez won is, is one that, unfortunately, uh, modern people don't like to hear because they think it's actually um, supporting the, the Spanish conquest, which was brutal, okay? It's not doing that. But will you agree with me that in the Old Testament, God often used other nations to punish nations? Yes. Yes. That is what he did there. And to prove it was God, you have 120 Spaniards versus, I don't know, a million or so Aztecs, and they win. That ain't, that ain't natural. That's not natural. And by the way, when, 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 when God, I mean, you can argue about the Spaniards not being very good Christians, and you'd probably be right. But nevertheless, when Christianity came into Mexico and in that area of the world, the one thing that did happen was the sacrifices stopped. But in California, it's Jesus who's evil. It's these, these demons that are, that are good. And they're inviting children to open up because the children don't know what they're doing. They're just doing it to get a grade. But they're, they're inviting them because we want to be more pluralistic or woke or whatever they want to call it. But they're inviting these demons in the children's lives. You think that we're not going to have to answer for that as a culture? Does, does Jesus love the children? Yeah. But you're setting them up for demon possession? Wow. I would not want to answer before God for what they're planning. But it's not just there throughout the nation. There is a widespread move away from the Almighty. Has been for, for, for actually decades, it's been kind of moving in that direction. But more rapidly, over the last eight to 10 years, I would say. But the thing that, the thing that, that, that I, I uh, I'm mentioning this not not for the purpose of being political, so I don't want to get into a political discussion about it. I'm making a biblical point here. When uh, there was a, a man from the House of Representatives who got up to pray when the new legislature came in, to pray for the legislation and the body and all of that, and he got up, and, and the, the, the main thing that he got remembered for was that he ended the prayer with a man and a woman. All right? That's how he ended it. A man and a woman. Which shows that he has no idea what a man actually means. But what they didn't talk about, except for some Christian brothers that I know and trust, because I listened to it and I was like, wait a minute. He mentioned the name of a God there. It ain't Jesus. What was it? Well, he had, he had prayed to Brahma, the Hindu god. By the way, the guy that prayed this was a Methodist minister. He prayed to Brahma and to the gods worshipped by many peoples. That they would come in and bless the legislation. Now, here's my point biblically. When you invite the devil in, he doesn't need too many invitations. And it wasn't like two days later that you had that assault on the Capitol. Mm -hmm. 
and the violence that happened there. All right? That, in my mind, they're related. You invite the devil in. Well, where did he attack? Right where they said that prayer. God allowed it. I said, fine. You want the demons? There you go. It's called God lifting his hand of protection. And letting them have a little see of what that looks like. You know, we have, we have, we have, uh, and the church in the United States has unfortunately been complicit in many of this, these things. Not every single congregation, but by and large, complicit because we have either said nothing Going back to Corinthians, we turned our eyes. Well, you know that's that's them, and we, you know, we're we're not going to say anything. But when you've allowed it in your own congregations, and then you're surprised when the people who are supposedly your churchgoers go to Washington and do these things, well, where'd they get it from? A lot of them got it from the pews that were sitting there. So what that means then is, is that Paul's warning to the Corinthians is a warning to us. We've turned a blind eye to it in our own congregations. We've ordained pastors who preach not the gospel, but are, 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 are preaching heresy. And I got this. And and we don't we, 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 we don't police ourselves in love. In love is important because that's what we we don't police ourselves in love. We don't correct anybody. And of course the other side of this is that because we're so fractured in the United States, as far as being the body of Christ, that let's say that uh, over it Judy's congregation, they, 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 they discipline someone for an actual sin. I'm not talking about minor things, but, you know, for an actual sin. They won't repent. Uh, so they're, they're removed from the roster, and they, they, they need to repent. Well, you know what they'll do? They'll just go right down the road and join the next church, and that, that church will, will care a who about whether, whether they were... Uh, excommunicated or not, because you know why? Well, that's the assembly of God. They won't actually consider were they right? Are we inviting this into our congregation now? I had, uh, I had a couple of mine out ask me, uh, they had a woman who was in after, mm -hmm. was just looking forward to have her same sex marriage. Yeah. And they said, what should we do? And I said, get out of there. Go oh, yeah. to the church that it talks about scripture and what yeah. and do it. And they say, how are we thinking of it? Yeah. Yeah, it's time. And that's the only thing that I could tell them. Well, that, and that's right. You know, and, I, and I've, I've said that to people, too. You can't stay. You got to go. I told one person once. I said, look, you are angry and bitter at your pastor. Because they are teaching against the atonement of Jesus. Now, I said, you need to get out of there for two reasons. One is because sitting in that kind of teaching is not doing your soul any good. You don't need doubt and unbelief coming into your, into your spirit. I said, but the second part is that you cannot remain there hating your pastor. That's a sin, too. You need to get out, you need to pray for her, and you need to get out so that you can properly pray for her and get the emotional distance that you need. So she needs saved, and you need to pray for her salvation. So there is a time to say bye for both your own good, but also for their good. 
so that you can pray for them properly, as opposed to being angry all the time. Although, you know, and, and of course, here's the other thing, all right? We've got to be very careful about our flesh. Believe it or not, some people like to be angry. I know, but some people do. And evidently, it gives them a real high. And they'll go just so they can be angry. I'm like, that is possibly the dumbest thing I've ever seen in my life. But, you know, it's also a sin. And that... That's right. You need to you need to die on that because you're just creating unforgiveness in your heart. I had a friend of mine from my notch. She's a very anointed person, and she said uh, they were in California. They're worshiping a 65 foot wall in the woods there. Mm -hmm. It's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. What's, this has been going on for a long time. Oh yeah, yeah. And, and, and the thing is that, that when you're looking at, at um, with, the, with the increase in drug use, the availability of drugs and the legalization of some of these drugs, uh, people are losing their minds. And they're, they're being led to all kinds of different demonic things. So, and, and, and I've actually seen pastors in some churches that support that, I think it's wonderful. Uh, that there was even in California some pastors that took pictures of, uh, of notices that were on on the from the from the the, the, the the city. You know when people were looting, at one point, the city put up these things on the on the. Uh, what do you call them? Telephone, they're all telephone yeah. poles. You know, not billboards, but you know, wherever you plaster things in the city there. And they were inviting people to realize, look, if someone comes in to steal, remember, they might actually need it. And, 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 and it's just stuff. So don't call the police. Just let them go. And this one pastor thought, well, that's a wonderful idea. We can just, and, 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 and the problem with that is that, is that in, 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 in considering that a good idea, you've actually invited people to agree with you that stealing is no longer a problem. That we can go ahead and break God's commandments if it's useful to us. Well, I can think of all kinds of commandments that we might break because it's useful to us. For one thing, I love food. I can see me breaking that gluttony thing real quickly here. I mean, we've got to be careful of what we're ready to endorse and say, this is a wonderful idea. No, it's not. I would not for one minute Tell my congregation, you know what? It's a good thing to seal. Or you know what? You ought to remember that, that you know, let, let the shoe be on the other foot and realize that they're having a hard time. Go ahead, let them have it. And, and don't, don't, don't bother calling the police. You know, I'm sorry. You know, you know what it says uh, in, in Proverbs that, you know, people don't necessarily feel bad. They don't necessarily hate the thief who will steal for bread, okay? And yet when he's caught, he's still gonna have to pay the, pay the fine. Because guess what? Stealing is still stealing. It's still wrong. You know, they don't have to, they, they, it doesn't have to be a, a, it doesn't have to be a crime committed without a gun uh, to have, you know, that, that, well, we'll have sympathy on that, but not on this. No, stealing, stealing. It's still a sin. People need to repent. Turn to God. But when you start, it's like Paul was saying here, when you start letting just little things slide, they're sins. I'm not talking about, well, I like asparagus and she likes broccoli. Right? That's, that's a matter of taste. But when you're talking about actual sins, when you just let them slide, calling no one to repentance, then you're just building up 
to a point where, again, evil becomes good and good becomes evil. And you're no longer the church. You're a social club. We've been, we've been spoiled up in this country. We come home, like tonight's meeting, you come mm -hmm. home and all your furniture and everything in the house is gone. Yep. And you know, it's nice to see a thief, but to, to be a victim of one is not very fun. No, 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 no. And and see when when you when you when you then, uh, I know enough people who have had had burglaries and whatever, and even if they weren't there when the burglary happened, they still feel violated and unsafe in their home, and, and, as well they should. They were violated. It is it's not that is not God's good will. Okay, it's not. But if you get up the next morning and you got two uh, racks, a cord and three quarters in each rack, gone. Yep. A lot of work. Yep. It's gone in one night. Oh, yeah. Yep, that's right. All right, that brings us to this, verse 5. All right. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. That would be true for every individual Christian, and that would be true for the body as a whole. Examine yourselves. Are you really following Christ? Now, I want to say this. He says here, test yourselves, or do you not realize uh, this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you okay now that's a very important point because it's one thing to examine yourself is another thing to have Jesus do it for you see if, if we if we examine ourselves and, and we're the only ones doing it we can run ourselves down pretty good and despair because of our sin or we won't do an effective job. We'll go either way on that. But when the Holy Spirit comes in, that's the Spirit of Jesus, and we allow him to examine our lives, it's an open book to him anyway. Well, then he'll be the one that actually will put his finger on the thing that needs to get changed. Okay? And by the way, sometimes you'll be amazed it won't be the thing that you think it is. It may not be the thing that other people would think it is because Jesus is not interested in the symptoms. He goes right to the root. He said, that's the thing that needs to come out. That's what we're going to deal with. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm reminded of, of a woman, uh, and actually there's been more than one woman now, um, I think about at least three women that I prayed with who had fibromyalgia. And they, they, they came for prayer for that problem. But Jesus was not interested in dealing with that problem. He was interested in dealing with the abuse that happened when they were kids and the unforgiveness that they had, and, and the self-hatred that they had. And when he touched that root in each one of them, and they repented of the self-hatred, they forgave themselves and whoever hurt them. Every last one of them got healed. Didn't even have to pray for the fibromyalgia, just, it went. You know, it's interesting because doctors will tell you that it is a nerve problem but they don't know why it's caused. But Jesus does. And he touched each one of them. Same, not, not exactly the same situation, but the same issue, generally speaking. And as he dealt with the root, they got delivered. So I think, I think if we're going to examine ourselves, let Jesus be the one in charge of that. But we need to submit to it. Let him do the checking, and then he'll 
put his finger on the problem. And then once he does, do whatever he tells you. Amen. Amen. I got to tell you a little story. I, you get to the point where sometimes you don't think you belong to Jesus. And the enemy comes in and does that. And I, I just I said, Lord, I said, Am I one of you or what? And he says, Yeah. He said, You're one of mine. Yeah. And that took care of it. Yeah. Yeah. But the enemy comes in and he just starts putting doubt and making you wonder what you know yeah yeah and when you and when you're examining yourself by your own flesh or your own your own means oh the devil likes that because that that by the way that was what caused martin luther to beat himself uh bloody because the devil would always remind him that you know he's 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 a he's a he's a worm who doesn't deserve god's grace and he would flagellate himself to unconsciousness. But when the Holy Spirit showed up, then he was fine. So we, that's, that's something to remember. When the Holy Spirit moves, he will convict you, but he won't condemn you. When you show up, or the enemy shows up, very often, condemnation is right there with it. Thank you, okay? Thank you. So, let the Holy Spirit, you need to open yourself up to the Holy Spirit to do that kind of work within you. And he'll take care of it. It might take care of it in a day. It might be a while. Because there might be a lot of things that you need to deal with prior to him dealing with that. But let him do it. But I want you to notice here it says, examine yourselves. Okay. That's also what Paul what was what, what what Paul and Peter mean when they say be sober minded. Be honest with yourself. Be honest about how the world really is. That you have a real enemy. And that you need to be doing things God's way. Be sober minded. Okay. All right, in verse 6, I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may not do wrong. Not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, uh, though we may seem to have failed. In other words, their, their whole argument against Paul and his ministry team was that uh, Paul and his team were, were, were wrongdoers, they were false, and weren't working for Christ, primarily because they were, they were doing ministry for free and weren't taking money. I mean, I'm sorry, but talk about deception. Meanwhile, these super apostles were actually bilking them for everything they had. But they were just fine. All right. But anyway, what he's saying is it's really not about us. We're not trying to make it about us. But everything we're doing is so that you might do what is right. And in the end, that's what all pastoral ministry is about that people might do what is right in God's sight. That's why people are equipped for discipleship. That, that's why we do Bible studies. That's why we preach sermons. That's why that people might live for God and die themselves. Okay? For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. And remember, Jesus said, I am the truth. So ultimately, it's about Jesus. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. Again, real ministry is about restoration. 
Even excommunication, by the way, is ultimately about restoration. You send the people out, they realize how bad it is out there, they repent and they come back. Glory. You learned your lesson. It's not about just shunning people and saying we've got nothing more to do with you. But it is about discipline. <clears throat> All right, for, these, for this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. And that's important for us to see. The authority that God gives is not primarily for tearing down. It's for building up. But if he has to tear it down to build it back up, he'll do it. Like if the foundation isn't right, start, get the foundation again, and then we'll build. He's been known to do that. He has. <laughs> All right. Any questions or comments so far? No? Go ahead, you got something. <laughs> you can tell, can't you? <laughs> Bishop Cole, you were talking about sending people out. He says that's what we do at our church. He said we equip them, train them. And out they go. Out they go. Yep. Out they go. Yep. See, ultimately, my prayer is that all of our congregations would end up being like Antioch churches. Where we're seeking God, we're being equipped, we're being discipled, and then we're being sent out. So that new congregations are built through Bible studies, prayer groups. That's what we're going to need. That, that's, what our, that's what our communities need. All right, they need to come alive. And finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. By the way, the word peace there, uh, the Hebrew word is shalom. And that word means to take what's out of place and put it back in its proper position. All right? To restore that which is out of order. And the God of love and peace will be with you. By the way, notice that. And, and the God of love and peace will be with you. So if you want the God of love and peace to be with you, what do you need to do? Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. See, that's one thing that unfortunately a, a lot of times in the church we don't we don't we don't think about is that there are there are conditions that God puts. If you want this, God wants you to have it. That means you need to do this and this, and then He will do this. But if you don't do that, then he can't give you this because he's a God of the covenant. He has to, he is legally bound by what he has promised. Greet one another with a holy kiss. Yes, they did kiss one another. <laughs> On the cheek. They, well, they had, all, they, 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 had they, they had other communicable diseases, but but the thing is that that I, I was sharing with somebody once because they, they we went to the East Coast and uh, they ran into my Italian relatives and they kissed everybody, everybody, everybody. <laughs> Mailman comes by. Oh no. Oh, come here! Hey, what's the matter for you? You know, kiss the dog, you know, whatever. But, um, 
But the way they, 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 they you know, it's a very Mediterranean thing, and they, 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 they kiss you on the cheek. If they're French, they kiss you on both cheeks, but we don't have any French in there. All right? But that, that's essentially what they're doing, is, you know, that, 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 holy, that holy kiss of greeting there. All right? And then verse 14, again, all the saints, I'm sorry, verse 13, all the saints greet you. By the way, that's a reminder that you're not alone, you're part of a larger body. Okay? You may not see them, but the saints greet you. And then we have this. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. All three members of the Trinity are associated with blessing the church. Well, what you know, it's the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Grace there means not only the un unmerited favor, love, and mercy of God, but it's, it's his power to do in you what your flesh can't do. That's the indwelling Holy Spirit. All right? And then the love of God. The thing we need to remember is that Jesus would not come at all, at all, except the Father so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. God loves you. Okay? And then the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit not only binds us together as the body of Christ for that fellowship, but when you receive the Holy Spirit, you also receive Jesus and the Father. All three dwell in you in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So you have fellowship with all of God, not just part of it. And that's good to know when you're walking through a dark time because you don't have to worry about uh, what's out there because he who's in you is far greater than he who's out there. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right, any questions or comments before we move on? All righty then. I have a question for you. What do you want to study next? Huh? Huh? What do you want to study next? What? 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 What about Daniel? All right, Daniel. You and I talked about that this morning. Yeah, Daniel, be all right. Anything else? What did she say? Daniel. Daniel? Yeah. Daniel, all right? Yeah. All right, let's go with Daniel. We'll meet again the, that last Monday in uh, March, which is just two weeks from now. And then we'll start with Daniel. What's that? The 16th, so two weeks from now. Would be what? 30th. The 30th. Yeah, today is the 15th. 15th, 29th. 29th. 16th is tomorrow. The 15th today. Oh, the 15th. Yeah. That's right. And again, on the, on the 16th, we have that healing meeting. So. Tomorrow, so it's 30th. All right. Oh, well, that's good. I promise you, Myrtle, that, that when you come here... You're going to have a cake for me? No. no, I promise you that I'll have the coffee out for you. Oh, okay. okay. And we'll sing happy birthday. Okay, yeah. We might even have, we might even have brownies. Two lead balls. <laughs> you don't want me making, making a cake. She's talking about cake. Oh, she is. Made your favorite dish 